Okay, this is the second half of the paper where I talk about human capabilities and uh, Marx and capitalism. So in this half, I talk more specifically about countries, China, Russia, the U.S. It's a dated paper, um, but I think it's dated in an important way to read it as it was. This was before uh, Putin got as authoritarian, that Russia started to get more reactionary, and that our relationship with them, uh, this is now 2015, has become more adversarial, uh, Ukraine and all of that. So um, what I say in this paper was true at the time, and of course nobody listens to the philosopher, so <laughs> what else is new? Okay, freedom of affiliation, China, Russia, and the U.S. Perhaps the most basic human freedom any society can provide its citizens is freedom of association. Without freedom of association, citizens cannot choose what foods to make or eat, whether to get an education, what to study, what they believe about the meaning of life, uh, being able to speak their minds to their friends, they cannot engage in a constant process of examination of themselves and their societies through access to newspapers, books, and formal and informal social gatherings. They cannot set up communities based on a worldview and encourage each other to live their lives according to that view. They cannot construct their lives in a way that promotes the cultivation of their higher order capabilities. Freedom of association is necessary but not sufficient for living a fully human life. For any one nation at any one time, the degree and nature of freedom of association in a country might vary, even when the goal is the cultivation of human capabilities. Sometimes the exercise of absolute power by a great politician can be the best means to the goal of cultivating capabilities in all citizens. The last monarchs of Singapore and Ataturk in Turkey are two examples. They both exercised absolute authority over their societies and restructured them so that within a generation the people would be much better able to govern themselves. Then they stepped down, leaving behind much uh, more egalitarian societies because they exercised absolute power they were able to develop every aspect of their societies. More importantly, they instilled in their people the desire to become self-governing. They urged their people to use their freedom to live middle-class lives and to want a moderate standard of living. They encouraged their people to use their newly granted freedom of association to nurture relationships and establish social institutions that would continually develop the capabilities of all citizens. The Russian Republic is also in a state of instability and great change. In an editorial published May 11, 2010, in the New York Times website, Thomas Sherlock, professor of political science at West Point, presents his own comments on the choice the Russians are making between developing a more authoritarian or a more democratic society. Sherlock argues that on the one hand, there are Russians who prefer authoritarianism, leading some Western scholars and commentators to claim that Stalin, quote, has enjoyed a gradual rehabilitation under Vladimir Putin, unquote. On the other hand, Sherlock says, quote, an opposing trend has been gathering in Russia for some time, often with the support of President Dmitry Medvedev and with at least partial approval of Prime Minister Putin, unquote, significantly the church is clearly supporting the move toward democracy. Quote, the Russian Orthodox Church also has weakened efforts to rehabilitate Stalin's image. Unquote. Most importantly, Sherlock insists that Americans and other Westerners stop engaging in demonizing the Russian Republic's history, culture, and economic structure and begin a true meaningful dialogue that recognizes and honestly discusses the complexities of human history in general and of the development of Russia in particular. Sherlock says, quote, 
to help ensure that Russia continues to lay the foundation for a democratic future, the West, particularly the former Soviet republics and European satellites, should engage in a supportive dialogue <laughs> with their Russian counterparts that addresses not only the crimes of Stalinism, but also the enormous contribution of the Soviet Union in defeating Nazi Germany." Unquote. This is so Greek to have a dialogue. All right. Given that Sherlock represents the U.S. military and has been given the freedom to write an editorial that was published in the New York Times, he clearly believes that loyalty to our own nation and our need for overall national security requires that we engage in meaningful dialogue, trade agreements, and all other kinds of cultural exchanges that will lead to the union of our collective future. Our prosperity and democratic system depends on Russia's prosperity and development of a democratic system. We need to play our part to help the Russian people develop their capabilities. Americans should encourage the Russians to develop what John Locke called civil society, because this is the kind of society we've always had. Histo supposedly, I mean, there's slavery and all of that. Historically, Americans have had a reputation for creating and joining all sorts of organization. Our founders gave citizens, citizens <laughs> virtually complete freedom of association to create and build a new society from the ground up. If it were remotely possible to make a relatively complete list of organizations in the United States, Russians and people from all over the world would most likely be astounded. The list would include hobbies, leisure time activities most people would not dream of choosing. It appears that the right of freedom of association is the cornerstone of the best society. It gives citizens the opportunity to develop their capabilities in exactly the way they want to. On the other hand, so it appears to be, on the other hand, history has shown that citizens born into society with a great deal of personal freedom sometimes freely choose to pursue pleasure, power, or other irrational goals in life, making their societies less stable, i.e. Athens <laughs> uh, and a few others. As the instability grows, they elect more authoritarian, le authoritarian leaders who take away individual th freedom in the name of preserving national security or social stability. For example, after losing the Peloponnesian War, the Athenians elected Critias, who took over the city and exercised absolute power in ways that promoted of himself and his friends at everyone else's expense, but it was all in the name of returning to the good old days, traditional values, family, patriotism, and God. Ironically, as Russia seems to be moving toward more freedom of association, ever since September 11, 2001, the United States seems to be moving in the opposite direction. Unfortunately, freedom of association does not necessarily lead to the cultivation of human capabilities. Since 9-11, Americans have been using their freedom to reject the value of human freedom in the name of freedom, like the Patriot Act. Under George W. Bush, the power of the presidency was greatly increased, both in the way it's structured and in the way he exercised his power. Even before 9-11, he introduced a policy of unilateral and preemptive first-strike military aggression. He backed the goals of the neoconservative faction in his administration, whose explicit goal has been to set up an American economic empire, leading supposedly to a Pax Americana in the 21st century. He systematically gave himself absolute power in his large-scale wiretapping program. Bush ignored laws passed by Congress in his extensive use of signing statements justified by the protection of national security in the face of terrorism. Bush went farther than Reagan or any other U.S. president since in the last 60 years, at least in his use of religion as an opiate of the people. Okay, justifying his policy recommendations and passing laws that he claimed were following the will of God. 
To give two examples, Bush claimed to care about preserving the institution of marriage and to want to prevent abortions, while at the same time he was creating policies that increased poverty, leading to more divorce and more abortions. Most ironically and most frighteningly, the number of hate groups in the United States has greatly increased since 9-11. The Southern Poverty Law Center monitors these groups and prosecutes crimes their members commit. On their website, the Southern Poverty Law Center says, quote, there are currently over a thousand known hate groups operating across the country, including neo-Nazis, Klansmen, white nationalists, neo-confederists, racist skinheads, black separatists, border vigilantes, and others, and their numbers are growing. Since 2000, the number of hate groups has increased by 54 percent." American citizens are choosing to join organizations that foster animosity and even violence between citizens, leading to the need for a more authoritarian government. In the name of rejecting the, author the authoritarianism of any government intervention in the market, even when it will lead to a stronger middle class, such groups accept more radical authoritarian beliefs. They reinterpret the motivations and worldviews of our founding fathers as promoting irrational allegiance to the conservative political party when our founders were actually radical liberal revolutionaries. These hate groups falsely associate the founders with anti-intellectual branches of Christianity even when the founders belong to Christian denominations that unite faith and reason, and they were, they were religious innovators. They were deists and theists and Unitarians and way out there in the left. A growing number of Americans believe in limitations on freedom of association, while at the same time not wanting the government to put legal restrictions on the market economy leading to more centralized power in both government and business and business intervention in government. These people want to limit the freedoms of others without themselves becoming more limited. It does not work. Although a large number of Americans are blind to the difference between the rhetoric of freedom and the actual development of human capabilities, the people in the rest of the world recognize the problem. Although the quality of life and the economic and political stability of a nation depend on many factors other than the structure of its economic system, newspapers are obsessed with the balance between the two main sources of power in any society, government and business. As the process of globalization expands, every nation will continually make decisions about how to find a balance between the free market and government regulations on the free market. Finding the correct balance between these two is affected by and in turn affects the healthy functioning of all the other sectors of society. When the wealthy get too powerful, they control the media and education and politics, stifling truly free intellectual inquiry. When greed becomes the primary motive, the, be, the behavior of, mo of most citizens, all sectors of society are corrupted. Law, medicine, the use of natural resources, to cite only three examples. The U.S. claims to have a relatively weak government, but the economic sector of the society is clearly very strong and has a great deal of control over every aspect of people's lives, including government. The previously communist nations of Russia and China now have more powerful economic sectors, but they've chosen very different paths toward the centralization or decentralization of political power. Each nation should be evaluated as more or less just based on whether the particular social and political institutions they have are probably the best possible given their particular situation. The two most powerful sectors of society, government and business, need to find the best balance of power 
leading to institutions that are most likely to develop the capabilities of the most citizens to the highest level possible for each citizen and within the limits of the nation's resources at any given time. The 1980s provided a great opportunity for everyone in the world to realize that the best way to provide for the capabilities of citizens is clearly in a middle ground between the absolutist ideologies of a free market and the absolutist ideologies of a government-controlled one. The rest of the world watched as the Soviet Union collapsed. Politicians used powerful rhetoric to declare the triumph of the free world and the free market over communist and a government-controlled economic system. At the very same time in the United States, under Pro President Ronald Reagan and a Republican-controlled Congress, the U.S. society was restructured to promote the advantages of the wealthy few at the expense of the working class. The creation, application, and enforcement of laws created a less regulated economic system than had been the case in the United States for many decades. Ironically, but not surprisingly, Reagan's free market policies were obviously leading to the very problems Karl Marx clearly described in the Communist Manifesto as the unavoidable and self-destructive consequences of an unregulated capitalist economic system. In fact, during the 80s, both extremes were revealed as unjust. Before the 80s and during the 80s, okay. In his report to the Communist Party Congress on February 25, 1986, Mikhail Gorbachev presents a long list of observations about the changes in American society under Reagan to support his claim that in the postmodern world, conflict between owners and workers has just gotten worse. Among other problems, Gorbachev points out, first, the growing power of international corporations, leading to a shrinking middle class in the developed nations and an enslaved group of workers in the underdeveloped nations. This is 1986, okay, 30 years ago. Second, an impoverished national culture in which citizens become obsessed about money and focus on individual freedom at the expense of fellow citizens. Third, a competitive and destructive relationship between the free market nations. Fourth, the destruction of the natural environment, which will never be addressed through the free market alone without government incentives and regulations. Unquote. It was clear that the collapse of the Soviet Union did not prove that the U.S. supposedly won the Cold War. Gorbachev explicitly said that he was looking to the European Union as a more rational model for how to balance the powers of government and business in a way that would lead to developing the capabilities of the citizens. Of course, that's all 30 years has really changed the, the dialogue. Americans, and not even all Americans, were the only people who did not notice, who interpreted the situation as black and white, the good guys and the bad guys, like an American John Wayne movie. George W. Bush went even further than Ronald Reagan in decreasing government monitoring of the economic system. All of the problems Gorbachev described in the 1980s that emerged under Reagan got much worse under George W. Bush. John Locke and Adam Smith are cited as the founding fathers of a free market, minimal government, and social and economic society. Those who use Locke and Smith to justify minimal intervention in the market today, however, have to quote the text out of context. More careful readings of each author's work even the works most cited by libertarian, minimal government believers should lead to different conclusions. First, Locke's second treatise on government was rejecting the foundations of his own society. He was rejecting inherited wealth, especially the estates established during feudalism. He was rejecting an absolute monarch, monarchy that invoked divine right of kings to exercise his authority. Locke argued for a labor theory of value 
people deserve wealth only as a result of their own work, and when they do work, they deserve the fruit of their labors. Quote, it is labor indeed that puts the difference of value on each thing, unquote. Locke argued for the value of exploiting natural resources for human well-being, particularly through agriculture. Quote, as much land as a man tills, plants, improves, cultivates, and can use the product of, so much is his property, unquote. His ideal is of hard-working, economically self-sufficient families in the context of a barter system of exchange. Locke condemns the introduction of money into the system of exchange. He knew that once economic value is determined by money, those who have an economic advantage can save their money, leading to a greater advantage and eventually to an entrenched gap between the rich and the poor. Quote, Men have agreed to a disproportionate and unequal possession of the earth. They having, by a tacit and voluntary consent, found out a way how a man may fairly possess more land than he himself can use the product of by receiving in exchange for the overplus gold and silver, which may be hoarded up, unquote. Locke explicitly condemns excess wealth as unjust. No legitimate set of laws will support citizens in excess wealth. Quote, the partage of things in an inequality of private possessions men have made practicable out of the bounds of society and without compact. This partage of things. Okay, so you only get as much land as you can use. No excess. Locke was extremely progressive, even revolutionary in his time. He formulated a view of culture that would fit with the Industrial Revolution and with a switch from feudal land ownership to a more egalitarian model. For Locke, America was the Garden of Eden, a land filled with natural resources that people without inherited land or privilege could cultivate, leading to social mobility through personal effort alone. However, Locke's social context is fundamentally different from the global economic system today. Locke would condemn any laws today that protect the excess accumulation of wealth for a few citizens at the expense of the creation of a large and thriving middle class. The actual standard of living considered middle class is much higher than it was in Locke's day, but the basic principle of a just society is one that develops and maintains the largest possible middle class was of primary importance to Locke, as it was to Aristotle. If alive today, Locke would advocate government intervention in the market because of the way money has led to huge, powerful international financial systems that, when unregulated, lead to the control of the international economy by the wealthiest few. Further, Locke assumed the earth could be exploited for resources indefinitely without limit. If alive today, he would advocate laws that prevent unlimited exploitation, because it's obvious that such exploitation is leading to self-destruction, and Locke was an empiricist. <laughs> facts, you have to act on facts. Finally, Locke would agree that the United Nations Capabilities Model as the best standard by which to determine the justice and injustice of any social system, because because the goal of Locke's vision, he would agree with it, because the goal of Locke's vision, a vision he describes by using the words human rights, was a vision of the cultivation of capabilities in a much larger percentage of the citizens than the system he was born into. Locke's description of the rights to life, liberty, health, and possessions was modified by our own founding fathers to be the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Certainly Locke's right to health did not refer to the immense array of health care remedies, products, and services available today. Locke's principles have to be interpreted and adapted to the realities of human life and health care today. Our founders wrote a constitution and set up a legal system that was designed to be able to adapt to future changes. The one guiding light I would submit determining what and how to make changes would be the nurturing and preserving 
of a large and stable middle class within the context of the cultivation of all the capabilities. Adam Smith, whose book, The Wealth of Nation, has been falsely worshipped as the handbook for free market capitalism, would also reject an ungoverned marketplace in our day and age. More importantly, he would reject the cultivation of a culture of greed, the false belief that excess wealth is the greatest indication of individual social or political success. The book, his book is the best book ever written for why the mercantile system Smith grew up in was non-natural and dysfunctional. Instead, leaders ought to organize the economic system in a way that allows it to function according to natural laws that emerge from the new foundation for economics, which is industry. Quote, Smith's intellectual point of departure was his discovery of an orderly and beneficent system operating behind the cruel, haphazard economy of 18th century Britain. Smith attacked the restrictive practices of mercantilism and wished to free the economy to operate in accordance with the laws of nature. Smith argued that the industrialization of labor was an important and huge step forward in the evolution of society. It led to a great increase in the quantity of work as a result of the division of labor. The division of labor led to the increased dexterity in every particular workman, the saving of time which is commonly lost in passing from one kind of work to another, and the invention of a great number of machines which facilitate and reduce labor and enable one person to do the work of many." Unquote. Smith was concerned for the well-being of the working class and argued that his new system would promote the prosperity of the masses who previously had been forced to live under desperate con conditions. Quote, the great multiplication of the productions of all the different arts as a consequence of the division of labor occasions in a well-governed society that universal wealth extends itself to the lowest ranks of the people. Every workman has a great quantity of his own work to dispose of beyond what he himself has need for. A general plenty spreads through all the various ranks of the society." Unquote. Smith explains that, quote, this division of labor, from which so many advantages are derived, is not originally the, fe the effect of any human wisdom, which foresees and intends that general wealth to which it gives rise. It is the necessary, though very slow and gradual, consequence of a certain disposition in human nature which has in view no such extensive purpose, the disposition to barter and exchange one thing for another." Unquote. Adam Smith's famous doctrine of the invisible hand is the claim that the source of human economic well-being is every worker's regard to his own interest because, quote, the certainty of being able to exchange all that surplus produ produce of his own labor, which is over and above his own consumption, for such parts of the produce of other men's labor as he may have need of, encourages every person to apply himself to a particular occupation and to cultivate and bring to perfection whatever talent or genius he may possess for that particular kind of business. Unquote. Like Locke, Smith first sets out his ideal society, quote, in that original state of things which precedes both the ownership of land and the accumulation of capital, the whole product of labor belongs to the laborer. He has neither landlord nor master to share with him. Had this state continued, the wages of labor would have grown with all those improvements in its productive powers, to which the division of labor gives rise. All things would gradually have become cheaper. They would have been produced by a smaller quantity of labor, and as the commodities produced by equal quantities of labor would naturally in this state of things be exchanged for one another, they would have been purchased likewise with the product of a smaller quantity." Unquote. In this original state, Workers would be highly motivated to work hard and continually perfect their expertise because they knew they would be personally and immediately rewarded 
for their efforts. There would be more and more division, more and more products, more and more different kinds of products, more and more uh, power of the worker to have money or exchange with other workers, so better products at lower prices. Also like Locke, Smith knew that the introduction of ways to accumulate wealth of ways to accumulate wealth ruined the original Garden of Eden. Quote, this original state of things in which laborer enjoyed the whole product of his own labor could not last beyond the first introduction of the ownership of land and the accumulation of capital. It was at end, therefore, long before the most considerable improvements were made in the productive powers of labor and it would be to no purpose to trace further what might have been its effects upon the compensation or wages of labor." Unquote. Instead of a world where the invisible hand is at work, Smith describes the world he actually lives in. With the ownership of property, those who can gradually accumulate wealth uh, who own can gradually accumulate wealth, while those who work for them can be treated in ways that prevent them from owning land. The owner controls wages. The worker has to borrow money for seeds and equipment and pay back later when the harvest comes in. The owner controls the price. No matter how well the worker does his job, his wages can be kept low enough so he can never move into the class of owners. Instead of a win-win situation where everyone achieves a level of excellence in his trade and barters with others who also thrive from doing their jobs well, Smith describes the world of class warfare. Quote, what the common wages of labor are depends everywhere upon the contract usually made between these two parties, workmen and masters, whose interests are by no means the same. The workmen desire to get as much po as possible, the masters to give as little as possible. The former are likely to combine in order to raise, the latter in order to lower the wages of labor." Unquote. Further, Smith points out that the workers are bound to lose. Smith even suggests the need for government regulation to prevent the rich from meeting secretly to control wages and other techniques to maintain control of the economic and political system. Quote, the masters, being few in number, can combine much more easily, and the law authorizes, or at least does not prohibit, their combinations. Well, it prohibits those of the workmen. This is before unions. We have no acts of parliament against combining to lower the price of work but many against combining to raise it. In all such cases, the masters can hold out much longer." Unquote. Smith points out that the media and rumor mill is completely biased on the side of the wealthy. Quote, we rarely hear of the associations of masters, though frequently of, the so of those of workmen. Masters are always and everywhere in a sort of unspoken but constant and uniform association not to raise the wages of labor above their actual rate. Masters sometimes enter into particular association to lower the wages of labor even below this rate. These are always conducted with the utmost silence and secrecy." Unquote. When the workers resist being oppressed, quote, whether their unions are offensive or defenses, they are always abundantly heard of. Unquote. Because the owners often deprive workers of even the most basic needs, the workers, quote, take always recourse to the loudest clamor and sometimes to the most shocking violence and outrage. They are desperate and act with the folly and extravagance of desperate men who must either starve or frighten their masters into an immediate compliance with their demands, unquote. The owners can then get public opinion and force the law on their side. Quote, the masters upon these occasions are just as noisy and never cease to call aloud for the assistance of the civil authorities and the rigorous execution of those laws which have been enacted with so much severity against the unions of servants, laborers, and journeymen. 
The workmen accordingly very seldom derive any advantage from the violence of those to, uh, unions, which partly from the actions of the civil officials, partly from the superior steadiness of the masters, partly from the necessity which the greater part of the workmen un, are under of submitting for the sake of immediate subsistence, generally end in nothing but the punishment or ruin of the ringleaders." Unquote. Adam Smith, therefore, has been falsely identified as the founding father of the form of laissez-faire capitalism that began after he wrote the book and continues to this day. Scholars recognize both that, quote, Smith's argument served as the basis for 19th century laissez-faire theories and that proponents of those theories carried Smith's ideas to an extreme of which he would not have approved. Unquote. Unlike the false stereotypes perpetuated about Adam Smith today, quote, Smith was not an apologist for any one system or class, but industrial capitalists and their supporters later used his arguments to keep industry free from any form of government regulation. Unquote. Clearly, the wealth of nations recognizes the need for an independent media and an independent political system that will regulate the economic system. Smith would clearly support policies that promote the prosperity of all citizens and would advocate educating citizens to desire both to do their jobs well and to live moderate middle class lives so that everyone can prosper. Prosperity is maximized when class war is kept at a minimum. Animosity between the rich and poor and laws and institutions that enable the rich to become entrenched and isolated pervert the economic system as well as every other aspect of personal, social, and political life. Smith's position is expanded in his book, The Theory of Sentiments. Here, Smith makes it clear that he wanted to cultivate the Aristotelian virtues especially the virtues of personal moderate, moderation and social benevolence, often translated from Aristotle as liberality, as the necessary preconditions for all the other personal, social, and political virtues, as Aristotle claimed. Smith would not advocate minimal government intervention in the international market system today because it's clear that the system will self-destruct without regulation and transparency. Smith valued a strong middle class more than a free market. Smith, like Locke and the United Nations today, defended a new economic system on the grounds that it was a better system for the cultivation of human capabilities through greater economic prosperity and greater access to all of that prosperity. Smith would also advocate the kinds of interventions in the market that are shown to promote the capabilities of every citizen. Those who only know the ideological oversimplification of Adam Smith's work would be surprised to know that Smith would understand and agree with Karl Marx's description of the corruption of capitalism so vividly described in the Communist Manifesto. Smith pointed out that even in the England of his day, a free market without adequate regulation and transparency already had led to a class war that only the wealthy would win. Instead of learning the lesson of the need for rational intervention through politics and the press, the British industrial capitalists continued to exploit their workers. The animosity between the classes got worse. Marx's manifesto describes how capitalism developed 70 years after Smith's Wealth of Nations. Marx tells us that what Smith feared is what in fact happened. First, they agree that the new economic system led to a change in all aspects of life. Quoting from Marx, the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionaries revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the relations of production and with them the whole relations of society." Unquote. Second, Marx and Smith agree that this change was one step in social evolution. People were forced to move from the country to the city 
and to interact in ways that more, were more complex and provided the opportunity for the cultivation of more humane, more human capabilities. Quote, this is Marx. The means of production and of exchange on whose foundation the bourgeoisie built itself up were generated in feudal society. At a certain stage in the development of these means of production and of exchange, the conditions under which feudal society produced and exchanged, the feudal organization of agriculture and manufacturing industry, in one word, the feudal relations of property became no longer compatible with the already developed productive forces. They were burst asunder. Into their place stepped free competition. This is during the Industrial Era." Unquote. Marx and Smith would agree that this process is positive only if the increase in wealth and complexity is distributed justly in ways that develop the capabilities of everyone. Smith seemed to think it was possible to link the new system to the development of a strong middle class, although it would take a commitment on the part of those with power and wealth to want to structure their legal system and to educate their children in ways that would lead to sharing wealth and privilege. Marx points out that this is not what happened, and he claims that it never could happen as long as the system was based on private property. Unfortunately, capitalism did not lead to a better life for most people at that time because of the abuses of those with power and wealth. Instead of freeing the economic system from mercantilism and feudalism so that more people could participate in economic life, cultivate their talents, and be rewarded for it, Marx says that, quote, modern interest industry has converted the little workshop of the patriarchal master into the great factory of the industrial capitalists. Masses of laborers crowded into the factory are organized like soldiers. As privates of the industrial army, they are placed under, under the command of a perfect hierarchy of officers and sergeants. Not only are they slaves to the bourgeoisie class and of the bourgeoisie state, they are daily and hourly enslaved by the machine, by the overseer, and above all by the individual bourgeoisie manufacturer himself." Unquote. This is what Adam Smith observed and feared most. By pointing out the possible corruption of the new system, Smith hoped that those in charge would work to avoid such extreme abuses. Smith wanted to reform the economic system to make it more efficient and more, and more accessible to all. He did not want to create a foundation for the barbarism of a society based on greed, as Marx claims occurred. Quote, Mark, from Marx. The bourgeoisie has resolved personal worth into exchange value, and in place of the numberless, indefeasible chartered freedoms, has set up that single, unconscionable freedom, free trade, in one word, for exploitation, veiled by religious and political illusions, it has substituted naked, shameless, direct, brutal exploitation. <laughs> Unquote. I mean, Aristotle thought greed was bad. Marx thought greed was bad. <laughs> Instead of making a more efficient system that enabled the masses to pull themselves out of destitution, making them producers and consumers of products that met the basic needs and went beyond the basics to additional comforts in life, the new system had led people to desperation once again and got them to believe that wealth is a source of human happiness. Capitalism made, in, made them into consumers who were then not given the level of prosperity necessary to satisfy their newly created desires. Both Marx and Smith also understood the crucial place of a political culture that was not corrupted by wealth. Lawmakers would have to make laws that challenged the greed of the richest and that prevented them from being able to accumulate more and more wealth. Citizens would have to recognize those politicians who are both willing and able to rule for the well-being of the ruled, both rich and poor. Where Smith put his faith in the education of the future rulers, as Aristotle did, 
Marx claimed that capitalism by nature would never be structured to be just. Instead, the modern form of government is simply and can only be an extension of bourgeoisie wealth and power. Quote, the bourgeoisie has at last, since the establishment of modern industry and of the world market, conquered for itself in the modern representative state, exclusive political sway. The executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. Smith would reject Marx's dialectical materialism, his eschatology, his view of last things, the end of history, his recommendation to abolish private property, and Marx's belief in the necessity of the temporary dictatorship of the proletariat as a step toward a classless society. Smith would claim that a revolution, with all of its violence and social chaos, would lead to the same result as the riots he saw during his time. The rich run to the police and politicians, who then put the workers or revolutionaries down, making them worse off than ever. Smith would follow Aristotle's understanding of statecraft as the ability to weave together the rich and poor to create a solid middle class. Locke and Smith were great progressives in their day, trying to move their nations and their world from leftover feudalism into the modern industrial era. If alive today, they would be at the forefront of policy formation and the intellectual articulation of a new postmodern technological era. Both of them made recommendations that would promote the cultivation of the capabilities of many more citizens than their societies they were born into were set up to promote at the time. Both would advocate an end to discrimination of all kinds, based on knowledge and experience. Both were advocates of scientific method as the foundation for a new paradigm for cultural life. Both would change their minds if they were given adequate information to justify the claim that the market had to be controlled more than they anticipated, given their own circumstances and inability to see many generations ahead. Both agree with Marx when Marx focuses on the corrupting influence of greed on all aspects of society and on the way excess greed makes societies more prone to revolution. Plato and Aristotle made those claims long ago. Locke, Smith, Plato, and Aristotle all agree with Marx's condemnation of greed, but disagree completely with his claim that a working class revolution and the abolition of private property is a solution. Conclusions Returning to the United Nations capabilities model, insofar as it conforms to Aristotle's vision of the completely flourishing human being as one that is actually exercising all of his or her capabilities, the most appropriate conclusion to arrive at might be surprising. Beneath all the debates about freedom versus control over people's lives, certain patterns seem to emerge. Too much freedom can lead to social chaos and the need for a more authoritarian government, a government that is more likely to oppress and unnecessarily inhibit the exercise of capabilities. Too much control can lead to revolution, social chaos, and another authoritarian regime. There are numerous obstacles to the development and preservation of societies that cultivate capabilities. Corrupt leaders who use their power in whatever sector of society they exercise it to promote their own wealth and centralize their own power at the expense of others and of overall social well-being. Two, well-intentioned leaders who do not know or miscalculate what they must do to promote human capabilities to use their power wisely and justly. Three, external attacks or legitimate threats that demand more authoritarian policies for the sake of national security. Four, natural disasters. Five, the increase in human vice among the majority of citizens over time, leading to moral decline. Greed, pride, lust, gluttony, sloth, 
self-righteous indignation that leads to animosity between citizens, envy, and a shrinking middle class. Some of these threats can be prevented. Others can be faced in ways that continue to promote well-being or that fail to do so. The art of statecraft is the art of weaving together the rich and poor through laws, institutions, education, all sorts of opportunities for interaction among citizens that promotes the cultivation of capabilities. Interestingly, if one reads Aristotle Locke Smith and America's founders through the lens of what they were trying to accomplish during their lifetimes, the best interpretation would be that they arose from a specific historical context, could recognize their situation as one variation on the theme of the human condition, and wrote texts that could be and that should be applied in a way that best promotes the cultivation of capabilities. Certainly their work has more often than not been used to promote the advantage of an educated elite that uses their education to justify their privilege, even when they do not exercise power justly, due to corruption or incompetence. Yet their work has been passed down from one generation to the next because it's motivated by the love of wisdom, their desire to establish a more practically wise foundation for society. Intellectuals today who are working in that same spirit those whose work represents the art of statecraft today make recommendations about how best to construct all aspects of society and culture so as to cultivate capabilities. This paper is one small effort to participate in that project, to provide another lens through which to understand what is happening and to guide change so that present and future leaders will have adequate intellectual tools to make better choices about how to form policies and to explain those policies so that citizens will know how to think about and recognize true statecraft when they are being led wisely.